Yes, hello. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for making it after lunch. It's really lovely to see you all. Uh, my name is Esra, and this is what we're going to talk about. And um, yeah, let's get ready. So this is going to be a very nerdy session. So there's a few seats in the front. There's going to be numbers here. If you have problems seeing long distance, I would really encourage you to come to the front. So now is your time to move. OK? All right. <laughs> One brave person. Thank you. OK, so here we go. Now, the starting point of it is working in media organizations is kind of like where's Wally or where's Waldo. Is everybody familiar with this? Yes? Is there anyone who's not familiar with this? Can anybody find Wally? If you don't know where he is, come and ask me after the session, because there's actually a, a trick, there's a hack to how to find him, and it will ruin your word while the experience for life. But basically, when I think about media, this is what I think about. It's a very crowded landscape. There are some people hanging out in the front. There are some people hanging out at the beach, getting a suntan. But it's very, very crowded, and it's very, very hard to distinguish yourself. So a lot of people start to look at what their competitors are doing or what's going on around them. And you know we have these things of pivot to video or everybody's got to do VR or, oh, let's do Facebook Live and all of these things. Everybody looks around them and starts copying. And instead of distinguishing ourselves, we end up with something like this. So this is actually a real picture from London. It, they do this Where's Wally run, and I think they pay 17 pounds. They'll send you a beret, glasses, and a shirt, and then off you go running. So what we actually want to be doing is this. <laughs> We want to be the sheepdog that stands out in the middle of these sheep. So how do we do that? Well, this is what we do. Uh, OK, slides are a bit messed up. But I'll give you the example of business. So let's say that you're the BBC. You've got over 30 language services. And you've got a very, very crowded space here. You've got. Bloomberg, you've got Forbes, you've got Cheddar, you've got Wall Street Journal. So everybody knows you maybe as BBC News. How do you stand out in this very, very competed place? And um, this is just a Deutsche Welle video I was thinking of showing you guys, but it's not going to work, so let's go to the next one. Now, this is a very difficult slide to see, but I'll explain to you what's going on. Um, we're going into nerd territory right now. What I'm going to walk you through in the next kind of 50 minutes or so is if anybody's working in digital or interested in working in digital, what happens if you're given a set of data like this? What do you start to do with it? And how do you build a strategy from there? Now, this is coming from a person who strategically failed maths. So when I was in high school growing up in Sydney, Australia, I was also a full-time athlete. And I knew that I wasn't going to have time to put all of this energy and investment into into all of my topics. So I decided that I wasn't going to pay attention to maths, so I did strategically fail maths by one point. And then the irony is that I deal with numbers and statistics on a daily basis. So that's maths revenge. So what I want to show you is actually data that I've taken from CrowdTangle. And it's very useful that James Morgan is in the room. James, we want to wave to everybody. So if anybody has questions about CrowdTangle, he's here, and I think he can help you out later. So CrowdTangle is basically a platform that was acquired by Facebook in November 2016, and it was made for social discovery, but actually what I use it for is competitor um, analysis and to have a look at our own performance. Now, the way that I start off with is when I'm looking at data, I'm going to look at the last 12 months on a monthly basis, or I'm going to go two, back two years and look at a quarterly basis. And it's very hard for you guys to see this. Front row, can you even see like what's going on up here? Just a little bit. If you have glasses, put them on right now. So I can, I can explain to you what's going on. I'm looking at Q1 2016, and my total posts are about 2,100. I've broken down into what this looks like on a daily basis. I'm looking at my overall interaction rate. Overall interaction rate is looking at the total number of interactions divided by, let's say, the fans that I have on my page. I've broken down then into formats. So I've got links, photo, and status. And then I've got video. 
And what you might not see is I've also broken down what video looks like. So you have your own, your own video that you own, so that's your native video. So let's say that this is Facebook, so we're paying attention to Facebook. You've got shared video, so you might have more than one site and you're sharing video. And you have other videos, so this might be you're sharing something across from Instagram, sharing something from Twitter, or sharing something from YouTube. Then what I do is I break it down into what does this look like on a daily average basis? And then I do the same thing. I'm looking for what does the interaction rate for each piece of that format look like? Is everybody still with me at this point? Yeah? <laughs> Just nod even if you're not with me at this point, like you're doing a great job. Okay. And then you'll see here, I've got average video interaction rate as well. So basically, I've got my raw numbers up here, and I'm breaking it down into a percentage down here. So I'm doing the same thing. I'm having a look at my average video interaction rate. What does it look like for my own video, my shared video, and everything like this? And I'll explain to you why I'm looking at that and not aggregate numbers. At the very, very bottom, I'm having a look at what my raw audience number is. Here it's 870,000. And I'm having a look at what the percentage of growth is. And what you can do on CrowdTangle is you can really customize your lists. So for this particular presence, and I I'm, I'm actually don't remember who it is, I've drawn up a list of competitors, so it could be BBC, Al Jazeera, Sky, whatever, and I will never, never touch those lists. I want to keep it consistent throughout the whole year. And I can see at this point, I am 21 out of 39. My average growth is 8%, but my competitor's average growth is 13%. So I already know that I'm, I'm behind what my competitors are doing. Um, if anybody's like, you're talking too fast, I don't understand what you're saying, numbers are not my thing, um, feel free to interrupt me and we'll go along. Because I think this is really important and I think a lot of journalists get really intimidated by numbers. But if I, as a, a maths failure, can <laughs> understand this and figure it out, you can too. Okay, so um, I, talked th I talked through the first thing I defined was the first quarter, I'm looking at engagement, and then having a look here, I know it's really, really hard to read, but what I've done here is I've looked at my weakest format type. So I've got my links, my photo, and my status, and I can see that my status is performing the worst out of everything. Now, looking at one quarter's worth of data, I'm not gonna do anything, because uh, I remember actually this example from the BBC, BBC Russian, do you guys remember um, there was the downing of the Malaysia Airlines plane in Ukraine and everything that was going on? So that turned out to be, in terms of numbers, a record-breaking month for BBC Russian. But then the next quarter, they saw their numbers drop massively. So if you were just looking at numbers, you'd say, oh, you guys aren't doing too well. But actually, they started from a very big high, and when they came down, they were still performing better than average. So that's why I'm looking at the next quarter. When I look at video, I mentioned at the beginning I've broken down what my video looks like. I've also broken down my video type and I'm also looking for my weakest type of video. And here my weakest type of video is other video. Okay, so then what happens is we go along to Q2 2016. So, so let, let's see what happens in Q2. So I can see the total number of my links has gone down. I've gone down from about 1400 to 1200. So what should we be expecting to be happening with the engagement rate? Anyone? This is supposed to be interactive session, so someone has to talk. Yeah, who said that? Okay, you're my hero. So, <laughs> exactly, so this is the result. You're in my session yesterday. No, just say yes. Okay, high five. <laughs> Okay, so it, it has actually moved. It's gone from 0 0.04 to 0 0.05. My weakest format is still my status. It's actually gone down from 0 0.02 to 0 0.01. And if I was to have a look at uh, my status, I can see it's dropped down, but my audience is not interested. My audience doesn't like when I'm doing um, statuses. Let's have a look at Q3. Let's keep going. My links have continued to go, go down. So they've gone down from... 1422, 1259, and they've gone down below 1000. So my friend at the back, what do you think is going to happen? Well, there are some tipping points. There's so maybe, it's, maybe you're over the tipping point. I'm just curious right now. But what do you expect is going to happen? If the yeah. number that I'm publishing is going down, what do you think is going to happen to my engagement rate? Yeah, and the first time I said rising, but th there is also some tipping point that it can 
uh, uh, slow down. So what do you yeah. expect is going to happen? Is it going to go up okay, or down? It's going down. Right we now. should actually take wagers on this and see what happens. <laughs> How much cash do you have on you right now? <laughs> A bottle okay. of wine, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... As my links continue to decrease, my interaction rate is going up. So what that tells me, without even looking at the content, I'm just looking at numbers, right? Without even looking at the content, this is telling me that my audience is appreciating that I'm not spamming them so much, right? And a lot of broadcasters tend to do this. They think, oh my gosh, I have 24 pieces of content. I have to publish 24 pieces of content. No, that's not what you do. Okay, so our weakest format persists, which is status. It's still not performing well. It's still at 0.01%. Meanwhile, I see something interesting happening. I have my strongest video type emerging, which is my own content. It started off at 0.06%. It's gone up to 0.014%. But again, one quarter is not enough time to make a decision about data. So what I'm going to be doing as somebody who works in strategy, makes digital decisions, I'm just going to keep my eye on it and see what's going on. Let's have a look at what's happening in Q4. The suspense is building, right, guys? It's pretty exciting. <laughs> I'm glad that James appreciates my nerd humor. OK, so uh, I put here, uh-oh. What has happened is actually the number of links went up. So as somebody, again, who's looking at the numbers, the first thing that I would do is get in touch with this team and basically say, what's going on? You guys have been decreasing for the last three quarters, and now all of a sudden you have a turnaround. So my friend in the back, as my links have gone up, what's happening to my in engagement rate? Yeah, exactly. And that's exactly what happened. My engagement rate has um, slightly gone down as a result of my increasing links. So it's pretty obvious, as soon as I start spamming my audience, my audience is not going to like it. They're not going to be engaging with my content. So this video type in the bottom, meanwhile, it's held strong. It's still at 0.0%. So it's still performing a lot better than my videos. And I know this is really difficult to see. So after this presentation, I'll upload all of this onto SlideShare. If you just go to slideshare.com and search for my name, Esra D. Um, if you get bored in this presentation, you can go look at my other presentations as well. And um, I'll put this stuff up on there. And it's all like this, so you can just really walk through. And I would hope that you'd be able to take something like this back to your newsroom and put it into practice. OK, so the reason that I have this arrow going back is I always want to cross-reference my data. So I'm not just looking at the percentages. I also want to see what's happening in real life as well. And for latecomers, there are still a few seats available around here if you want to, if you want to come through. So please do come forward and take a seat. So let's have a look at now Q1 2017. So this is looking at data at the beginning of the year. So my links have continued to go up. So what's your name? Dowell, what do you think's happened? Uh, it, sh it should go down right then. My engagement rate is going down. Yeah. So we would expect that my audience is not liking what I'm doing. And yeah, that's exactly what's happened as well. The more links that I'm publishing, my engagement is going down. My audience is not happy with what I'm doing. Meanwhile, my own interaction rate is still the strongest, but I've put here, look what it's doing to the average. So I mentioned, or you can see that I've got this average number at the top. And I really wish I had a pointy stick like Hans Rosling at this point, and I don't. Does anyone know Hans Rosling? I make all these nerd jokes and nobody laughs. Like, seriously, guys. OK, so I'm looking at my average video interaction rate. It started off at 0 0.5, 0 0.03, 0 0.5, 0 0.04, 0 0.02. Meanwhile, this is 0 0.09. So what is going on here? And now I have five quarters worth of data to start making comparisons. I can see that I have one strong performing category of video, but the other two weak performing categories are bringing my average down. So again, as somebody who's working in strategy, I would look in this and say, it's pretty obvious what I need to do. So uh, I need another new friend. So based on what you can see now, what would you decide to do with the other data? Yeah. You'd get rid of the other types of video. Get rid of the stats pose. Yeah. So just by looking at the numbers, that's, that's exactly the decision that I would make. However, numbers don't always tell the story. Yeah. So 
So uh, James is in the room who has a definitive answer, but I also think I have a pretty good idea. So the way that um, I actually wrote an article, again, if anybody's bored, you can Google and have a look at this article I wrote, which is that despite the fact, even if Facebook changes the algorithm, if you have a good relationship with your audience and they're coming to you, you're always going to beat the algorithm because Facebook is going to surface content that you are engaging with. And so if your video is constantly being interacted with, it's, it's going to constantly service this type of video. But if you start to spam your audience with links and this other type of people, uh, sorry, this other type of people you don't like, other type of content that you don't like, it's going to be surfing this kind of stuff less and less and less. So if you, if you focus on engagement, loyalty, and building a relationship with your audience, it doesn't matter what the algorithm does. Even, let's say, in the hypothetical situation that China Weibo comes along and buys Facebook and decides to shut it down, your audience is still going to seek you out somewhere else. And by the way, I'm not joking about that. I think these are things that we should be talking about. Like maybe, you know, two years time, Mark Zuckerberg is going to come along and say, oh, Facebook was an experiment. I'm going to shut this down right now. Um, I know these are kind of extreme scenarios, but I still think that we should be thinking about not being so platform dependent and rather thinking a bit more strategically about it as well. But again, we can talk about this later in the discussion if this resonates with some people. Okay, so um, I already mentioned that it's going down. So I don't want to go through the rest of the quarters because you kind of get a gist of what I'm doing with this. So I'm looking at long enough data to start to see some of the patterns. Um, some conclusions that I can make and you'll see that on the far right side, I've got an average number. And my average number is pulling seven quarters worth of data. So it's pretty significant numbers that I have right now. And I can see straight away, I'm publishing too many links. So if we're looking at three months worth of data, I'm publishing 1,300 links, which turns out to be 14 links per day. So I don't know about you guys, but any news organization that I would be following on Facebook, if they're pushing out 14 links a day, I'm really not interested, and I'm not reading 14 links a day. Is anybody reading 14 links a day? If you do, you're basically a superhuman being. So, <laughs> and then with the correlation for that, so my friend in the back was saying, rightly so, that as the number of links went up, the engagement is going down. So if you were to follow this, you would see that that's exactly what's happening. As the number of links go up, your engagement is going down because the audience is not happy with what you're doing. Am I speaking too fast? We got reprimanded on our panel yesterday for we were really excited and speaking too quickly and the translator couldn't keep up with us. Okay, so now that I have seven quarters worth of data, I kind of want to look at the overall picture. And I've highlighted here photo because I didn't talk about photo at all. And when I'm looking down here, I can see actually that my average number is pretty, pretty big, it's 0 0.05. And then when I have a look at the quarters individually, I can see that I've got, some, I've got some pretty good quarters. I've got some weak ones, but they're generally pretty good. So what I'm gonna do from here is I'm gonna have a look at, okay, well, how much, how much am I really publishing on a quarterly basis? And what does that look like on a daily basis? And I can see that the average that I'm publishing on a day is just one photo. Now that photo doesn't need to be a photo, it could be a still, it could be an interactive, it could be something, something graphic. But I can see that it's working really well, my audience really likes it, so why am I doing just one? I can make some decisions here, which you pointed out as well. I can see that I have two types of video that is just not performing. So what I would make a decision from here is, I would either mitigate it or stop. What I mean when I say mitigation is, I'm gonna try to save this type of content. And this is where I'm gonna start going to the team. So again, uh, I used to work at the BBC. BBC is now 43 different language services. And I don't speak 43 different languages. So what I would do is, I would probably go to my counterpart or the social media editor at, let's say, BBC Arabic. And I'd say, look, dude, these videos aren't working. Why? And this person might say, well, we used to have rights access, so we were cross-posting from Reuters, but we don't anymore. Or maybe they're publishing at the wrong time. Maybe they're publishing at midnight when their audience is active at 6 in the morning. So I would try these experiments to try to save the content, running from a minimum of two weeks to two months to see what happens. That's going to give me enough data to make a decision. And also, once I'm working with these teams, they should be interrogating the numbers far better than I am. I'm looking at this data on a quarterly basis, and I have a lot of accounts to look at, so I can't go deep. 
but what I would really encourage you guys to do is make sure that you have a point person with each team who is keeping track of these numbers. And then for somebody like me, I would have an oversight of this and then start to pick up the patterns. We have something here that's really emerged as a winner, which is my own video. And I can see that my average interaction rate is 0 0.07. And it turns out to be the best performing type of content that I've been doing for the last seven quarters. So I'm going to keep on doing this. So how do I make strategy now? So I have seven quarters worth of data. Now I'm in a position to start making some recommendations. So even though this was Q4 and we're already past Q1 2018, this is actually a real example that I did. By looking at this data, I saw that they're publishing an average of 14 links, one picture, and five videos, bringing together all these types of videos. So my recommendations to this team is, OK, for Q4, I want you to be doing no more than 10 links a day. I want you to double the video that you're doing, so it's two. No statuses. Stop doing statuses because it doesn't work. And I want you to do six videos a day. And those six videos should be your own videos. So you can see very, very clearly that, that this starts to become strategy. The other really good thing about this is it starts to build an accountability. So if I have my point person in a team, whether it's a social media editor or a web editor, and if I've got sign off, I can go to these guys at the end of Q4, and if they've been publishing 16, I'd be like, dudes, what's going on? You said you were going to do two, you're publishing 16. And the numbers, I mean, I've done this quite a few times, and I know this to be true. If they follow the strategy, the numbers are going to come up. So, yeah, okay. Now, let's have a look at this bottom half of the chart, because we really haven't talked about that at all. I mentioned at the beginning that I'm tracking my growth, and I'm also tracking my competitors' average growth. By the end of the year, I see that I'm at 11.76% growth. My competitors are at 1277 so I know I'm just slightly behind my competitors. The reason that becomes very important is I've met a lot of kind of traditional editors who say, oh, I want this account to grow by 100% next year. And I can say, actually, no, that's not going to happen because the market is only growing at 12%. And I can give them a more realistic target and say, all right, let's aim for 15 and then if I start to hit that 15% target for at least three, qu three consecutive quarters, I can then rebase my targets and say, all right, let's go 20%. I remember when actually I was at the BBC, um, BBC Arabic was growing so quickly that I set them some ridiculous targets, like 50% or something. And uh, their video editor, I was just, I was killing her. And she came to me and said, oh, Esra, please, like, you got to slow down. We can't do it. And despite the fact that I had set them ridiculous targets, they were still exceeding what they were doing one year ago. So that's another thing to watch out for. Are you guys still with me, or do we need to like get espresso in the room? <laughs> OK, we're good. <laughs> OK, when I look at the bottom, though, I also mentioned that I'm tracking what my position is with regards to competitors. So what I've been doing all year is paying attention to my rank. So I've got 39 people here, 39 competitors that I've identified. and. I've started from 21, I've gone to 9, and then I've dropped down so that my average is 19 out of 39. So a very realistic target to have set for 2018 would be, I want to be in the top 15 of my 39 competitors. And then I'm going to pay attention to this number as well. Oops. I think I've got like actually the wrong slides that I'm showing you. So let's have a look here. Just give me one second. Now is the time to play with your phones. Yeah, I do actually, I have actually opened the wrong slides for you guys. Sorry about that. James, do you want to like sing a song in the meantime? <laughs> James is Scottish, so he is entertaining. <laughs> Thanks, James. I'm talking about like native video, so it would be content that you own and that you are going to be sharing. Yeah. Not necessarily. So I mean, if you're, if you're, okay. So I'll just repeat the question. So the question that I had is, when you're producing your own strategy, do I? Whoops, what's going on? 
When I'm producing my own strategy, do I take into account that it's a lot more expensive to produce your own video? It's a very, very valid question, and I'll go around it like this. When I go to people and I say that you should be doing this, the first reaction that I get is resistance, which is, we're so busy, we don't have time, we don't have money. But actually, what I've been asking all these guys to do is do less, right? So you're freeing up time, you're freeing up people, but what I'm asking them to do is to produce more quality content. So if you're doing 10 videos a day and I'm asking you to do five, I want you to spend that time instead to come up with something that's guaranteed to work. And it doesn't necessarily take much. I, again, at the BBC, I did an experiment with, we were, we contended that we could make videos on mobile phone faster than doing it in a studio. And the actual fastest time that we did it with people who, by the way, didn't always have video editing skills was 30 minutes. 30 minutes just to put video together. And the way that we did it is, so a top story today is the bombing of Syria, right? So targeted bombing by the US, UK and France. And uh, I don't know what's going on here. Maybe tech people can help me out. Um, so one of the things that, oops. Sorry guys, but you know, it wouldn't be a conference if there wasn't tech problems. So yeah, it's just not, oh, there we go. So uh, again, for example, at the BBC, if we knew that this was a top story, we know that it's published on site. We know that we've already got rights to these images and everything like that. We know we've got our own correspondence. So we would go take that information, turn it into a video and then publish it. And also, James, do you have anything to add to that as a fellow BBC alumni? <laughs> okay, James is the eternal diplomat. Okay, so having looked at all of this data, there's one thing that I didn't talk about at all, and that is the aggregate audience number. And I like to think of it as a kind of social media 1.0 and social media 2.0. So um, is there anyone here who was on Facebook before 2007? One person, right. So you will remember, you, you'll probably remember this. So when Facebook first came about and media companies or brands were trying to get on Facebook, the thing that they were trying to do is get as many followers as possible, right? They're just trying to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow and grow, right? So that's actually turns out to be not a very good strategy anymore. So again, like I've been talking about BBC because I used to work there, but we can also talk about CNN. If you have a look at the BBC page on Facebook right now, there's about 32 million people on that page. Do you think that 32 million people are getting that content every day? No. No. So um, I have a friend who works at Financial Times, and I went up to her recently and said, you guys need to do a better job on Facebook because I never see your content. She said, well, actually, we are doing a really good job on Facebook, and our numbers tell us this. And what had happened was I would signed up to the Financial Times to follow their page on Facebook in 2007, and because it was the very beginning, it was really bad content. So I didn't like it. I didn't share it. I didn't comment on it. And as a result, it stopped being surfaced in my algorithm. So if I'm not engaging with this content, it's not going to surface. And that's exactly what's happening on, on Facebook and on other platforms today. If you're not engaging with it, it's not gonna serve. So if any media organization comes and says, we wanna double our audience, I contend that it's a very old way of thinking. It's more about engagement and building a relationship with your audience. Um, a couple of media companies that are doing this that I would like to point to, one is AJ Plus. So AJ Plus is a spin-off from Al Jazeera. They really know their audience. They're not trying to be the king. They're trying to go for a very specific market, which is uh, young people in America, and they're exposing them to news that mainstream outlets don't typically report about, and they have slight, a slightly activist edge. The other one that was actually mentioned at this conference was the Huffington Post UK. Polly Curtis talked about that. She said, we've already got this really big audience. Now we're paying attention to really engaging with their audience. If you start to give people the content that they love and they care about and they interact with, they are then more likely to comment on it, to share on it, and that's how you're going to have this organic audience growth. So I had mentioned um, earlier to gentlemen gentleman in the front that that's the way that you're going to grow your audience and, and your engagement, and that's the way to go. Now, coming back to this number. We started off the audience with 870,000. It's gone up to 1.9 million, and that reflects almost a 230% increase over the last almost two years. And I've highlighted it in this big fat red line because if you focus on your engagement rate, if you focus on just doing this one thing right, 
all of your other numbers will go up. You will see increases in your audience, in your engagement, and you'll see uh, increase in your yeah you'll see increase in your interaction rate, and that means not spamming your audience. Does that make sense? Like if there's one lesson I want you guys to take away from this is. Don't think about having a big audience. Think about having a following and committing, committed audience because again, if these platforms do anything, you're still gonna be safe. <laughs> okay, so, okay, cool, so what do I do? Um, if you wanted to do this in your own newsrooms, this is the best way that I can summarize it. And again, I'll put this all up on SlideShare so you'll be able to see it, but it's also being recorded as well. So first of all, you should define what metrics matter. So uh, I talk to a lot of people in competing news organizations, and whenever I hear the words views, reach, clicks, or impressions, I generally get the sense that they have no idea what they're talking about. Because I call these metrics vanity metrics. They make you feel really good about yourself, but they don't mean anything at the end of the day. And I see people like laughing, like, yeah, so this is resonating. Instead, the things that, I'm, I'm gonna ask you guys, what do you think are the things that we should be paying attention to? People were nodding, so I know you have an idea. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, okay. How much time you spend? I'll just repeat it, because we're just going quickly. Yeah, what else? Comments? Comments? Uh, kind of, that's an engagement rate, but what else? So we have um, conversion, which is a percentage number, how many are coming back. We have time spent. We have comments, which is from engagement rate. So these are all things that, yeah? Hmm? Yeah, returning people. So I would be att paying attention to things like unique page views. So you want to increase your uniques. You want to be having a look at your retention rate. So how far along is someone watching your video before they leave? How far down is someone reading your article before they go? And then the most successful videos I see, people watch it over and over and over and over again. So you get more than 100% retention rate and you know that you're doing something right. But all of this takes time and it takes an effort to sit down and to understand your data as well. Um, I did a talk in Berlin last year at uh, a d design firm that does a lot of work with media companies and they had this fantastic postcard at the front that said, real journalists need no analytics. And it was a tongue-in-cheek thing and I started to plaster it, you know, in my office and that kind of thing because there was still this mentality that, oh, I'm an editor and I have a hunch and this is going to work. But then I can show you all of these numbers and say, actually, it doesn't work. So the second thing is to go back in time. My recommendation would be look at the last 12 months on a monthly basis or look at the last two years on a quarterly basis. Then point number three, you saw that I was looking at performance across format. So format is, is it a link? Is it a photo? Is it a video? If it's a video, what type of video it is? And then I'm looking across my interaction rate. So I'm going down first, and then I'm gonna go across. And um, like, I really like Hans Rosling, so I just like stuck Hans Rosling in there. Um, number four is prescriptions. Once you have all of this data, you can very easily start to see the patterns. So if my friend in the back, my friend in the front, already from a 25 minute session are able to make some judgments on this, you can see that this is not actually rocket science. It just takes a little bit of time to get to know your data. And number five is, okay, now you can start to look at your competitors. But don't look at your competitors in, with a view to copying them. Look at them maybe to see them as a source of inspiration. So one sports team that I was working for noticed that they have a very skewed male audience, something like 90% male and 10% female. And they knew this was a problem. And no matter what they were doing on their page or on their site, they couldn't increase the female audience. So what they did is they built a list in CrowdTangle looking at other sports competitors who were covering women. And as they were tracking them, they actually discovered that they were covering women very, very badly, and the content was still seen from a, uh, a male focus. So I would be looking at uh, your competitors as a source of inspiration, but not necessarily as someone to copy. So here's 10 things I don't hate about you. So first of all, numbers are your friend. Get to know your numbers. If anybody actually wants more support from this, I'm gonna put my email and you can get in touch with me and also on Twitter whenever you like. Less is more. The point that I'm trying to make is if you ever go into a newsroom and people tell you that they're busy, 
busy is an excuse because it shows that they have a lack of ability to prioritize. So if this is important, you will always find the time to get things done. I see some smiles in the audience, so that's a good thing. So yeah, I'm asking you to do less. Um, the poorest performers overproduce content. So when I'm having a look at my big aggregate publishers like the New York Times, CNN, even Al Jazeera, they publish usually a lot, you know, between 40 to 50 pieces a day, but they have these giant, giant audience, but very, very, very small interaction. And that's because they're giant. So it's actually disadvantaging them. Uh, uh, anyone who works for Facebook can pretend that they don't see this. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I remember like last year, <laughs> sorry James, you know I like you. I remember that Facebook was really, really pushing lives, but according to my data that I pulled from CrowdTangle, lives was just not working. And again, I made the suggestion that you should mitigate your data, so that would be the time to start going and having a look at your lives. Are you just shooting really, really poorly or your audience doesn't care about them? See if you can save them. But from my general experience, Facebook Lives weren't working besides the big guys who are doing it. I also, it's really, really important to talk to people. So I made the point of, I don't speak 43 languages. I have no idea what's going on in all of these pages. What I would do is take these numbers, go sit with my sports editor, go sit with my Turkish editor and say, okay, what are you doing? Um, I remember with, uh, with the Russian service, we noticed that we were publishing content between, I think, like uh, overnight, so between 8 p.m. and 12, but then it actually turned out that the time that, we're, that they were most active was completely opposite. Uh, another account that I worked with was business, and they noticed that every Sunday, they had a lot of traffic coming from Africa for some reason. So we decided, okay, on Sunday during peak time for our African audience was the time that we were going to start publishing that content. I wouldn't know that by my numbers, but they would know that by continually patrolling these presences. So text still matters. A lot of people talk about, you know, pivot to video and they're trying to be all social. But um, there was a report by the Reuters Institute two years ago looking at digital video. I would really encourage you to go and have a look at it. It's all online. And also Nick Newman from the Reuters Institute, who kind of was the lead author, he's here. He found that there is an oversaturation of video and people are still paying attention to text. And if you want any proof of that, look at how good the New York Times is on Facebook and have a look at how they're doing their strategy where they're hooking in a younger audience using video, but people will still go and read these long forms. And it's the same thing with the with, uh, New Yorker. Anything you want to add there, James? Apart from I'm doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> I think like next year we should just do this together and like with, you know, ping pong and see what goes on. Okay, so build an experimentation. Um, this is really easy to say, but in practice I find that not very many people do it. And again, BBC story, so the team that I had at the BBC, I, I stole something from Google, which is um, what I call it, Creative Fridays, where I encourage my team not to do any work on Fridays and just experiment. But the people on my team were all part of different language services, and they're surrounded by traditional journalists. So if you're sitting at your desk and you're trying to make a, a video on your mobile and you're surrounded by people who looks like you're just playing on your phone, there's a lot of pressure to conform, right? And it takes a very strong personality to basically say, no, actually, I'm going to go do this without coming across as arrogant. But digital is a landscape that is changing and moving so fast that if you're not experimenting, you're not going to grow. And I think if you're a news organization who doesn't do this, then you're at a disadvantage. I just also want to point out somebody in the room. An Angela, who's sitting here, is actually one of the leads for the lab where I currently work. And um, if anybody wants to talk about like how she's done this, I'm sorry, but you know, I think you're great. Um, she can talk to you about how she's been running this experiment for about a year now. Yep. Okay, you don't need to be everything to anyone. This has come up in a few of the talks at this festival where just because somebody's doing VR or somebody's doing AI or somebody's doing graphics doesn't mean that you, do, you need to do. Figure out what you're good at, concentrate on that, and then maybe bring in 10% experimentation and see what happens. Um, female audience, so I kind of mentioned this. There was a report done that had a look at the representation of women and girls in news between 2005 and 2015 by the GMMP. You can also um, look at it, you can find that report online. 
and it showed that the average representation of women and girls in the news was 25%. It went up to 36% in North America, and it dropped down to 18% in Middle East and North Africa. So I mentioned the sports team that I worked on, they realized this and decided to make a conscious effort of turning it around. Again, with BBC Africa, James will remember this, we had a fantastic person there, Mariam Granvarzadeh, who managed to completely flip the female audience around on Facebook, doing this series called African Women That You Need to, do need to Know. And it wasn't looking at celebrities, it was just looking at everyday women from the community doing amazing things. And uh, I don't remember what the starting number from the audience was, but she flipped it around so that it was a female majority within, I think, about two months. Um, again, if you work for Facebook, like take this as loving feedback. <laughs> um, I think that Facebook needs to do a better job of tracking the female audience and Twitter as well. Uh, I find that Google Analytics and YouTube Analytics are really good because they give you a breakdown of the gender split. The reason also I'm talking about social platforms and not website analytics is I find that a lot of news organizations use marketing analytics behind their websites and it gives all the numbers that I was talking about. Views, clicks, impressions, reach. I can't do anything with those numbers and it doesn't give me a breakdown. The Financial Times did something very interesting, which is I think they've developed an in-house algorithm that to, I think it has 99% accuracy of saying who their audience is, whether they're, whether they're male or female. And um, I would really love to see Facebook and Twitter and others really pay attention to the female demographics so we can start to tackle this as well. Um, so if anybody understands what this reference is, I will give you five points. <laughs> Otherwise, um, that's the end of my presentation. Um, that's my email address, just my first name, last name, gmail.com, or you can reach out to me on Twitter as well. We've got about 10 minutes of questions. I know it's really hot in here, but as you know, weight trainers like to lose weight in saunas, so this might be a benefit of sitting in this room. Um, nobody likes my jokes. Okay. So, <laughs> I'm trying, guys. So, um, yeah, we've got about 10 minutes, and it would be really good to uh, see what kind of people are thinking about or even feedback. Can you go back one side? So, I'm going to go back after I've got the question from your fr friend behind you. Um, <coughs> oops. <laughs> Hello. Um, uh, my name is Karolus. I came from Lithuania. We have a, a small media agency there, and... Uh, what we noticed that we really need to engage with our, our own personal profiles in sharing our work, because when you work as an agency, uh, as a business basically on Facebook, posts usually perform poorer than you actually when you send it as a pers on your personal profile. If you have like public profile with a lot of followers, you really need to do that as a journalist. You you kind of have to make your own as a person's profile into your kind of business, uh, uh, continuation of your business. You cannot really have a per personal profile anymore. Could you tell more about the difference between personal profiles and business profiles? Yeah. Thank you. It's a, I think it's a really excellent point. So let's, so this g takes us back to like the beginning of social platform time. The whole purpose of having these social platforms are people are more likely to trust each other, right? So. Um, which hotel are you staying in? Oh, it's like the Mark Zuckerberg question. Don't tell me what, qu don't tell me. But let's just, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, let's just say from the journey from your hotel to here, you passed a thousand people. So that's like, oh, I reached a thousand people. But then you actually, you're engaging right now with about 80 people in the room, but you have really strong connections with about, let's say, 10 people here, right? So you and I now know each other because you've been in my session, you're asking questions. So if I see you later tonight or tomorrow, our engagement is going to be a lot better because we've already built a relationship and it's a social relationship. And if you have a look at studies done behind Facebook and other social platforms, people are more willing to trust content from from each other, from, from their friends. That's the, entirely the premise that it's built upon. And some of these changes that Facebook are making are trying to go back to that model because I don't want to say that the formula has been hijacked, but it has definitely been taken advantage of by nefarious entities. So coming to your point about doing it on your personal profile versus doing it on a, on a business page, um, New York Times does this where Nicholas Kristof, he will go into the comments and he will answer people. And I, I mean, 
I always like to look at numbers to do these types of things. So if I find that actually in Lithuania this is the case, then it would make sense for you to be doing things like this. Whereas at an entity like the BBC or Al Jazeera, there are various security risks with individual people exposing themselves. So they're not going to do it. They're going to, they'll maybe go into the comments as an institution. So. Uh, AJ Plus will reply or somebody else will reply. But I would say if it's working for you, go and do it. And you're building that social trust and social capital with your audience, but also be aware of the risks that it, it has to journalists as well. Um, I know Facebook has information on their pages about journalist security. Google has um, Project Shield as well, which is talking about basic digital security and stuff like that. So I don't want to be in the position to tell you what to do, but I can tell you kind of the logic and yeah, go for it. Yeah. I hope that does it answer, yeah? It's a Facebook like, okay. Yeah. Mike's coming. So you're like um, um, uh, comparing uh, the different quarters that are uh, uh, the following quarters. Uh, can you say something about um, um, like a yearly rhythm in, in, in analytics or in uh, results, because I'm experiencing that it's um, much more, um, um, well, it's b sometimes it's better to, to uh, compare quarter one with quarter one of the year before, because people in different stages of the year uh, do different things. Yeah. Um, yeah. And also about the benchmark, um, 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 can you also say something about um, uh, getting to know your uh, specific, your own audience better? Um, because you said a little bit about benchmarking with other um, uh, players in the, in the market, but um, in the analytics you can also uh, getting to know your specific um, uh, audience. So. Okay. How do you do that? So the first question is about maybe looking for yearly patterns when you're looking at data, so not just looking at 12 months but comparing. And then the second questions are about what kind of benchmarks I would set, or yeah, and also uh, about getting to know your specific, your own uh, uh, audience. So, okay. um, in my experience, um, uh, through data, I can see how my audience reacts differently than. Um, uh, um, uh, audiences of other yeah. uh, competitors. Okay, really good question. So you're exactly right on the rhythm. So the f what I was trying to show you with this data is, and like I've gone on and on and on about this, is the first thing any media organization should do is set the foundation. So a lot of people are doing a lot of things on digital and frankly, they don't have a clue what they're doing. They're just doing it because some young person five years ago set up a page and they're just trying to you know, perpetuate it. But um, one of the big projects that I did at the BBC was lead uh, YouTube World Service. And we had, 20, we had 20 languages with 20 different editors working on my team. And what we did after we set the foundation, so after we did something like this, we would also do quarterly reporting where I would go in and say, this is where we, this is where we are, Q1 2018. This is where we are, Q1 2017. And it does, I, I think you can get kind of really lost or maybe a little disconcerted of, oh, I'm not growing that much. But it's not always important to think about where you're headed. You should also be looking back at how far you've come and, and have a look at that. There are definitely patterns. So typically in Europe, July and August, you know, nothing goes on. So be nice to yourself <laughs> about that kind of thing. But it also creates an opportunity because if you're working for a big global organization, or let's say that you're a niche organization, um, like, so for example, Malta. So there are a lot of um, Maltese migrants living in Australia, completely different time zone. And when it's um, autumn here, it's spring in Australia. So I would be looking at those times as opportunities and saying, if it's a downtime in Europe, can I start to be pushing this content across a different time zone as well? So there's always these chances to look at opportunities. And then in terms of benchmarking your own audience, again, like what I showed you guys is pulling crowd tangle data, but you can do the same thing on Twitter, on um, Instagram, on YouTube, on Google Analytics. And start to figure out what's going on. So for example, for YouTube, the things that I would be looking at for every single one is watch time, uh, active subscribers, so the percentage of people who are on my page who are paying attention to it, 
and I would also be looking at the gender split and demographics, and I set each one of them as targets that I want to reach. But the very first thing to say before that is, you have to know who you are and what you are about. So when I work with teams, I'll go to them and say, okay, like, what are you trying to do? And, or who's your audience? And they'll say, everybody's my audience. I'm like, no, everybody's not your audience. Is your audience uh, 18 to 24, or are they 50 plus? Or where are they coming from? And uh, another, like, uh, you know, it's another BBC example, but um, we, had a we have a current affairs news program called Newsnight. And what we saw was that our TV audience was 55 and above, and they were watching an average of 20 minutes of TV every night. But when we looked at YouTube, our audience was all 35 and below, and they were watching five to 10 minutes of content, and 50% of the audience was coming from the United States. So, how, so knowing this data, we didn't even know that we had this big audience coming on YouTube, and we completely changed our strategy where we said, okay, we're not gonna put any UK content on YouTube anymore, we're gonna do all of the international stuff, because the American audience was interested in seeing how the British would cover international events. So I hope that answers your question, but I'm also going to be around so we can talk about that. Yes, Mario. Uh, Hang on a minute. Thank you. Um, I have two questions uh, related, which tie into the talks you did the other days, the panels about cultural change uh, in large news organizations or smaller news organizations. Um, so we have a new type of content analytics platform. And what we've noticed talking to publishers is that even though people increasingly know that those vanity metrics are useless, mm -hmm. people are married to them. And senior executives are usually married to them. And most of the time, even when they're getting faced with these facts, the numbers, they'll basically turn a blind eye because if you look, if they're still plugged into programmatic advertising or other channels, volume still wins in their eyes. Mm -hmm. So the first question is, what strategies have you noticed that are more effective at convincing some of these people who are set in their ways to look at the new data. Okay. And then the second one, well, let's get to that one first and then I'll, yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, so I'll tell you guys the story. So last year, um, I was speaking with one editor who's basically spamming her audience with video. And I sat down with her for 90 minutes with all my analytics, YouTube analytics. Basically, she's publishing 10 videos a day on YouTube and they were getting no more than 100 views each. So I sat with her to basically say, look, you're spamming your audience, that's why your audience isn't coming. And her response to me after 90 minutes was, well, the reason the audience isn't coming to us is because they haven't discovered our page yet. But they will in a year or two's time because that's how the internet works. And I could feel like the blood <laughs> going up into my head. And I think it was at that moment that I decided, I'm not going to evangelize anymore. I'm not going to actively try to bring people on the journey with me because you wear yourself out. Um, it's a waste of time. And usually they already think that they know better than you, even though they're print, usually journalists or whatever. And they're, they're just not going to be convinced. So the way that I went about it is I looked for allies. And this actually comes from a piece of advice that I was given by one of my mentors, which is whenever you're entering a new role, take the first six months just to get to know the lay of the land. Find out who your allies are, find out who the people who are gonna block you are, find out who the people who might look like your allies but actually they wanna sabotage you and stab you in the back. Take the time to figure out like what's going on and just talk to people and be friends with people. And so what I did is I found those people and I'm not trying to change the whole situation. I'm just gonna work with them because I know they get it and I know they're open for it and they're gonna come along with me. So I'd go for the people who are kind of, they're convinced and I'd also go for the people on the fence because I know I can convince them through my data. The other thing that I learned from Al Jazeera <laughs> is that um, media is all about egos. So like, I, like, I mean, I'm not gonna say I, but we used to kind of play people off each other. So this was the time that people weren't convinced about being on Twitter. So for example, like I'd go to you and be like, Mario, um, Angela's got 12,000 people on Twitter. You're not gonna let her get away with that, are you? And then I'd go over to Angela and be like, Angela, Mario's got 11 and a half thousand people on Twitter. He's catching up. You're not gonna let him get away with that. And then um, people start to compete with each other. And the way that I do it on an institutional level now is I don't play people off each other anymore, but I'll do a showcase. So. Um, for example, you might have a flagship show that's not convinced, 
but um, actually it's a real scenario where Russian, bless you, where Russian, Turkish, and Ukrainian are flying and they've completely transformed their audience in two months. They grew by something like 300%. And then everybody else is kind of like, whoa, what are these guys doing? You know, and so then you start to see people in the organization advocate for you and you don't even need to do anything. You're just kind of like PJ Barnum in the back orchestrating everything. Nope, there we go. Um, thank you. And the follow-up um, is if you have all this data and you buy into it and you have allies um, and you're trying to convince other people as well, how do you get those people to buy in? Because in a lot of cases as well, you do have the nerds like us who really care. And then there's authors who know they should care, but it's just like not accessible. And there's, there's a learning curve or even just an emotional adoption curve that is involved. So what do you do to kind of convince and make people excited and get them to actually use and look at the data? So I used to say that if you're working in social media, you need to be social. And I think it's absolutely true. So bye. So what I would do is it really, if you really care about this and if you really want these people to come along with you, take, take the time to sit with them. So I've heard of various schemes of like reverse mentoring. Don't just do that once, do that a few times or being embedded in a newsroom. So have like you know a one month stint where you're going and you're sitting with these teams or you're going and hanging out with them for one day a week just to show that you care. If somebody comes to me with a problem, I'll make sure that I'll try to solve it. And then I'll also make sure that I'll follow up with them as well, right? Because then it, it's just basic human psychology. It shows that you're really invested in them and you wanna see them succeed. And I think if, you have a lot of people who are kind of, you know, consultants, they'll just fly in, they'll give advice, they'll get paid really well and they'll leave. You don't want to be that kind of person, you want to be their friend. And I think if you, if you take the time and you, you gain that trust with them, you are going to see the results. But it's not going to be overnight. And we're done. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Thank you.